Hello, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Mission Critical Webinar Series, a co-production by CIM Magazine and SGS Natural Resources. I'm Ryan Bergen, Editor-in-Chief of CIM Magazine, and I'm joined by my co-host, David Ananachuk, Global VP of Metallurgy and Consulting at SGS Natural Resources. Uh, this series is focused on the development of Canada's store of critical minerals. It will bring in industry leaders to dig into the practical, political, and financial questions around what it will take to make good on this generational opportunity represented by the decarbonization and electrification of our economy. Now, before we get started, there's just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, one, uh, just please ensure uh, that to have optimal audio, make sure that you are using your computer audio. If you are using the computer audio, that the button for computer audio is selected on your control panel. Uh, if you have dialed in on your phone, ensure that the phone button is selected. If you have any questions during the discussion, please type them into the question box in your go to control panel. Um, and then we'll get to those questions uh, at the end in our Q&A uh, period. And then uh, if you do have questions, please just give them a, a proofread before you send them um, so that uh, we can make sure that uh, we get your message across. All right, now, I'm very excited to have everyone here today and to be joined by our co-host, David Ananachuk. David is an expert in critical minerals and battery supply chain and sits on both the Canadian Chamber of Commerce Critical Minerals Council and the Canadian Critical Minerals and Materials Alliance. Hi, David. Hey, Ryan. Great to be here, and uh, hi, everyone. All right. Thanks, David. Could you maybe give us a, a, a snapshot of what the Critical Mineral Council is? Sure. I mean, uh, yeah, the, the associations that you mentioned, uh, both the Critical Minerals Council and the Critical Mineral um, Canadian Critical Minerals and Material Alliance, I'll just say things have, have changed a lot and accelerated. Um, it's, it's a chance through these associations for industry members to come together and, and really have a voice, um, engage policy makers, both, you know, whether it's a federal level or a provincial level, but even internationally, um, you know, we're, we're talking with US embassy, German embassy, for example, and um, we're, we'll be in Ottawa tomorrow through the Canadian Critical Mineral Council, um, uh, like I said, this week, and um, in a couple of weeks, we'll be going to DC as well. So, um, it, like I said, these are quite important, and what's changed um, as an industry, we, we really need to have a voice and, and work together because we're the ones in the front line, you know, to to help give the right feedback on on what needs to be done. Great, thanks. So, David, would you like to introduce our guests? Sure. Well, um, great to have some uh, some experts with us here today, and very happy to have uh, Marcella Monroe and Chris Evans with us today. Marcella is the head of government affairs, uh, uh, the head of government and regulatory affairs at Tech Resources, as well as she's the co-chair for the Canadian Chamber of Commerce Critical Mineral Council. Um, as well, we have Chris. Um, he is. Um, an Australian um, lithium sector veteran, and he is the managing director of Winsome Resources, as well as looking at participating in the Critical Minerals Council. And I do want to thank both for, for being here today. Marcella, where, where are you today? Uh, I'm in Ottawa today. Lovely fall day here in Ottawa, nation's capital. And Chris is a little further away, and we appreciate the time because I think it's quite late at night for you. It is, David. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Ryan, for uh, hosting today's event. Uh, I'm in Perth in Western Australia at the moment, so it's almost one in the morning. But of course, it's a pleasure to be here. No, great. Thanks, guys, for, for participating and look forward to, to some of your comments today. All right. So then why don't we get into it? Um, <clears throat> late last year, uh, the federal government laid out its critical mineral strategy. Uh, it focuses on accelerating innovation and project development, including Indigenous people, uh, building both infrastructure and a workforce, and sec securing supply chains. Uh, the goal is to provide a responsible source of minerals for the electrification and decarbonization of the economy. The strategy includes a list of 31 minerals. Many of you will likely have seen our critical mineral maple. Um, 
And the report also tagged a short list of minerals, those being lithium, graphite, nickel, cobalt, copper, and rare earth elements as having the most potential for growth in Canada. Uh, since then, we have seen all kinds of activity further down the supply chain. Uh, for example, in May, the federal and Quebec government announced a partnership with General Motors and a subsidiary of the Korean conglomerate POSCO to build a factory for the production of electric vehicle parts in Quebec. Um, and then in August, uh, the two governments came to similar arrangement uh, with Ford and a South Korean partner. Uh, September, there was public funding for the retrofitting of a facility in Granby, Quebec to produce copper foil for EVs. Um, and that's just a few of the investments in, in Quebec. And then of course, in Ontario, we've had the uh, announcement uh, um, where both uh, the federal and provincial governments are putting big money behind a manufacturing plant for Ford, uh, Volkswagen and Stellantis. Um, but uh, up the supply chain, uh, it's been a bit of a different story. Yeah, and uh, Ryan, I know like I said, uh, yeah, if we talk about the next slide, th this is something I think was important to share this comes from Natural Resources Canada, um, as a lot of us uh, engage the government from the on the critical mineral policy. Um, this was their last update. So this isn't an analyst slide. This is the Canadian government telling us, um, you know, the the needs in terms of the future mines that need to be developed in some of these critical minerals like nickel, graphite, lithium, just to name a few. And if we look at the past, you know, we've only seen about four mines being developed. Well, going forward, there's 22 bubbles on the right side um, that they've identified to say uh, that need to be developed the next 15 years. And and this is this really poses a big challenge for us as an industry. I mean, it's it's a great opportunity, um, no question. But of course, it comes with challenges, and that's kind of what we really hope to talk to you today both to Marcella and Chris to kind of get some feedback on how they see this. Um, because what we've seen with all these announcements, you know, I think Canada's done a, a fantastic job of, of getting um, and connecting both, you know, mining, um, uh, the chemical and automotive supply chain together and getting people to want to invest in Canada. So these announcements aren't strictly, you know, if we think about North America, it is not strictly just um, everyone going to say, I want to be in the US, if we're talking about North America, they're coming to Canada and we're going to benefit from all that. So that's, I think that will, you know, we, we, we'd like everyone kind of speak to this today and say, how the heck are we going to manage this? Because there's a lot of resources, there's a lot of investment that's needed, you know, to make this happen. So, so maybe with that, we'll, we'll turn it over to you, uh, Marcella. So, you know, at a high level, where do you see the gaps here in policy? Where should we focus to, to make this, this actually happen? Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So, um, uh, you know, the, most of the investments that you just referenced there, the, the car electric vehicle battery facility investments, um, aren't directly from the critical mineral strategy. <laughs> like they certainly touch on them, they're part of that supply chain, but um, let's just take a, a little mini step backwards here and talk about what, what was actually in the Canadian government's critical minerals, mineral strategy, because that's that's why tech got involved with the Critical Minerals Council at the Chamber of Commerce. Um, you know, we really feel as uh, the largest uh, Canadian global mining company that we want to play a very significant role in critical minerals policy and, and development in the future, and we thought this is the best opportunity to do so. Uh, and so we we feel, first of all, pretty good about where the government landed. Uh, you know, they did a very broad consultation on their critical mineral strategy, uh, and we think that the document they came out the other side with was was pretty smart. Um, it's probably not everything we will need, uh, but I think you'll find when you look back, when it was introduced by Minister Wilkinson, it was very much and Minister Champagne, frankly, it was very much framed as this is the first step on this path. So in other words. What I like about it is the government's recognized that this probably isn't a one or two year project. When we're looking at the critical minerals, both opportunity and challenges we're facing as a country and globally, this is probably more of a generational challenge. And so that was just a really good framing exercise, we believe. 
Um, the other piece I think we liked that hasn't quite yet been implemented yet, well, a lot of the policy levers, which I'll talk to in a second, but first of all, there was a sizable investment the federal government announced uh, with that strategy and in the budget this year, and not all of that's come to fruition yet. So one of the things we're patiently waiting for, and, and uh, I, I think my colleagues in the Critical Minerals Council would agree, there's, there's about $4 billion that they've allocated to the first tranche, stage, whatever you want to name it, of critical minerals investments. Uh, and, and, and to your point, David, these investments are really made to sort of both speed up the pace with which we're able to up our production in, in some of these critical minerals, um, as well as to look at investments in, in other possibilities, whether they be refining, recycling, you know, how do we keep our smelters modernized? Uh, how do we make sure there is more room and more significant emphasis on indigenous participation these things are all very important so when i look at the key policy challenges i guess the first one is there's about just over one 1.5 billion dollars in that in that tranche of money that enercan is meant to put into critical minerals infrastructure what we mean by that um, is basically we know there are minerals rich areas of the country um, that uh, that are hard to access. Uh, usually these are transportation challenges, uh, also electrification challenges. I'm thinking specifically now like an area that we're very familiar with at Tech called uh, the Golden Triangle in Northwest British Columbia. We have a, a, a co-partnership there with Newmont on a project called Galore Creek. So that's just one example, but that area is rich with copper, nickel, gold, and other things that we will need to get more of. And so how do you, how do you, how does the federal government work with the provinces to open up those areas geographically? That money's still not being spent yet. So there's one sort of tranche. Then there's the whole uh, strategic innovation fund. So there was another billion plus amount of money put to TISED and NRCAN. Again, so to take a similar model they've used with strategic innovation fund for decarbonization, now pivot to look at critical minerals. Um, so that money is now uh, in the pipeline, if you will, and they're starting to look at investments there. We've got an EV battery recycling project we've applied to that we're very excited about. But again, the money that they've allocated there is meant, again, to help sort of more mid-downstream kinds of projects. Uh, so we think that that's super important. And then there are other sort of policy areas that that we think are critical that, that are covered in this strategy. And again, we haven't quite seen the force of movement yet, but I think one major one, and I've already mentioned Indigenous partnerships, <clears throat> I'm, I think for many of us who look at some of the ongoing uh, challenges perhaps that we've had with permitting in this country, uh, certainly a big piece of that puzzle has got to be how do we continue moving forward on the path of reconciliation with our Indigenous nations? Um, and we think there needs to be some more attention there. So it's certainly something the federal government recognizes in the strategy and looks at um, is, is how, do we, how do we basically incentivize and or provide support for Indigenous partnerships. So those are just three of the major chunks, David, as you can tell, I can go on and on. But if you yeah, I know. I mean, and that's the great thing through these associations and councils that it allows us to engage. And again, as I said in the beginning, it's, it's us as, as a group, as industry members, both large ones, you know, mid-tier, and, and even, you know, the junior miners as well, um, but speaking with the unified voice, because like I said, we're, we're all the companies that are in the field seeing this. And you're right, it's not, it's not actually a short list, but there are, but there are a few, you know, like I said, um, important points. Uh, to turn this over to Chris, I mean, you know, you're, you're a lithium explorer coming to Canada, you know, what kind of, how would you compare it to someone like tech you know, who's been in, in, in Canada for, you know, a long period and is established. So what unique view do you have, Chris, with uh, Winsome uh, coming to Canada? Thanks, David. Um, I think we're at the completely opposite end of the scale to tech, of course. We're, a, we're an explorer and, uh, and we're Australian. We're Australian listed, but all of our operations are focused in Quebec. Uh, and we've got a, a couple of different projects, but we're really focusing on developing our maiden resource on one of them and um, doing our studies in, with the aim of coming into production sort of five years time to produce a, a, a spodumene concentrate out of a hard rock lithium mine. And I, I look at, um, well, first of all, we came to Canada because Western Australia, where I'm currently sitting, uh, produces roughly 50% of the world's lithium as of today. And 
I was personally um, involved, I was in charge of constructing a lithium mine in Western Australia between about 2015 and 2019. So I've got some first-hand experience there. And I think Australian investors, it, it's, a, it's actually a great partnership between Australian investors and Canada. Uh, the world is now looking around, I think, for another source of hard rock lithium. And forgive me here, I'm going to talk almost exclusively from a lithium perspective because that's uh, that's our focus. Uh, and, and of course, lithium forms a, a, a uh, an essential part of the, the critical mineral supply chain in, in Canada. Um, the world, I think, has been looking around for a new source of hard rock lithium outside of Western Australia. Uh, there's four or five mines being opened up over the last seven or eight years in Western Australia to produce, as I said, almost 50% of the world's lithium. Hard rock lithium mining is a somewhat simpler process than than you see from the, the brines um, that predominantly come from South America, Chile and Argentina. And it seems that Quebec and Ontario in particular have got uh, large, resource, large resources, although largely unexplored at this point, uh, hard rock, uh, for hard rock lithium. So a lot of Australians who've investors and miners who've had success with lithium and now turning their eyes to, to Canada for these new sources of lithium and to develop new mines. So Australian investors like lithium and they've been willing to pour money in. Perhaps where Canadian investors so far haven't, haven't yet um, had so much success, in fact, Canada needs some more lithium success, uh, where, where it's only had a couple of bumps in the road so far with the old Namaska mine and the North American lithium mine, uh, both of which have um, temporarily halted, but now are starting again. And I see from, from our perspective as well, the there's the critical mineral strategy that uh, Marcella just referred to, much of which is, um, I think, yet to be accessed, again, as Marcella said. But the encouraging thing for me as well, the other backdrop is the large investments, which Ryan referred to at the beginning, um, that the government's made in with Ford, with GM, and most recently with Northvolt. Those gigafactories that are, or the cathode active material gigafactories that those organisations are building, and the money that the government allocated towards those um, mean that there's huge amounts of lithium needed to, to make those cathode active materials. So that that in itself is going to drive the need for more lithium mines. So, Chris, um, we talked to you, uh, we talked with you a while back, CIM Magazine, and um, you told us at that point that um, uh, in Quebec it feels very much like it did back in West Australia, and it's very much a land of opportunity. Uh, there are still new projects to be built, uh, however, the expertise to put in the project isn't quite there. Um, what do we need to get? What do we need to do to get to that place where we do have that expertise? I think the basics are there, given that uh, Quebec, in particular, um, where we're operating, is a mining a mining province by background. So, a lot of the basics are there, and and hard rock lithium mining in itself is fairly simple. It's mostly open pit mining, depending on the deposit. It's open pit hard rock mining. Um, so I think to bring the expertise, the expertise comes further downstream and that is with the processing, which again is not particularly technical, but still requires some expertise and it took all of the mines in Western Australia several years to ramp up to bring that expertise in. Um, I think, and I think maybe going back to Marcella's point, this needs to be viewed as a generational a generational initiative and opportunity in order to bring those skills in rather than just a short term uh, five year five year um, scheme so I think as that government as the as the funding available being made available by the government through the critical mineral strategy starts to flow down uh, that will lead to education it will lead to uh, indigenous participation which again will develop skills in in the local areas where our lithium mine is intended to be and where the others that are um, contemplated for construction are located that they're all fairly remote areas there isn't an immediately an immediate workforce in the locale so that's got to be drawn uh, in and again that's going to take many years 
Mm. I think it requires all of our cooperation to make sure that these resources are available. Um, so, Marcella, uh, from 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 Tech's perspective, as a you know a large operating company, what, what are the when it comes to capacity, um, what are the the key sort of human resource needs uh, that that Tech has identified as being you know critical to this moment? Well, that's an excellent question. I mean, we we have, we have generally needs on all of our sites for for more workers and it's the human resource challenge that we're all facing right now in mining is real um and so you know I, I i think we need to look at it from a broader perspective which is what again the critical mineral strategy in canada tried to say um so you know at tech we really believe strongly that it's it's up to us and it's something we're working on all the time to try and expand the participation of um people in our workforce, um, especially women uh, and people we don't normally see going into mining sites. We're, we're proud of the percentage of, of female workforce we have, but we think we can do better. And so we think that's something um, that the government and others, <clears throat> you know, that we need to continue to focus on from a policy perspective is just making sure that um, people start to understand that what you might have in the back of your mind is what the mining site looks like. It's not what mining looks like anymore. And that there's space on mining sites for a very diverse population, um, people from all different backgrounds. Uh, it's really it's really up to us to make sure our sites are welcoming and uh, that we're opening those doors wide. Because frankly, um, it's no longer just a nice to do because we're we're good people with strong inclusive values. Although that's part of it, um, it's going to be a business prerogative because we're going to start to run into a real problem with making sure that we have the staffing levels that we need. From the other side of it, I guess I would say, you know, as we're looking at our opportunities at the trail smelter, we know that smelting and refining is such an important part of where perhaps North America has lost a bit of the um, narrative uh, in terms of critical minerals. It's one of the challenges we have with Asia that we just don't have the same smelting and refining capacity that we actually need uh, to produce metals, materials. And at tech, we take that responsibility of having um, a really great smelter still in existence that we've invested and continue to invest a lot of money and that's why we're so excited about potential of doing electric vehicle battery recycling at trail um, but also from a human resources perspective the exact kind of jobs that that recycling facility would create are the exact kind of jobs that we need to um, be able to import probably at first from other jurisdictions but also to support uh, Canadian engineers you know uh, young people that look at engineering as a you know, as a possible future for themselves, and maybe they're into chemical engineering. Well, right now, some of that expertise anyway, if you were, you know, if you were a chemical engineer that uh, wanted to do some really interesting work, you might not think there's the opportunities for you in North America. You might be tempted to look at Europe or into Asia. We think we can keep some of that brain power here in Canada um, through the continuing, you know, support and expansion of our trail facility. And so there's, there's kind of two angles there. You know, like we've got to think both about the hardworking men and women that run the sites day to day. And then what does it mean to, you know, our ability to keep employing these very highly technically skilled um, workforce that we need to run sophisticated operations like we have at Trail? Uh, Martell, let's like, and Chris, like to add to your points, I mean, there's two things for me. Chris, you talked about, you know, the mates, let's say the more remote um, sites that need to be developed. We're going to need also trades. So we, we, you know, we know we need technical people, but we also need tradespeople. Um, and to, you know, to be able to do community community mapping, I think is going to be important. To how do we bring that the the, the right um, workforce into those regions? Because it's not something you can just turn on a dime and do. Uh, you know, having already worked in Northern Ontario and Northern Quebec. Um, and the second point is student visas. Um, I know sometimes we can't always hire the people we want in Canada and we have very good qualified people elsewhere. I could say as a company as SGS, sometimes we get stuck um, when we're trying to hire people through visas where the visa holdup is so long where some of these candidates um, who want to come across, um, they say, sorry, I've, it's been nine months, 12 months, but I, I, I can't wait. I'm going to take a job elsewhere and we lose people. Ryan, I think you said you, you suffered even the same issues um over in our, modest, magazine. in our modest ways yes <laughs> we actually had a there was a situation david in in western australia 
maybe eight years ago, Australia's uh, now richest woman, um, Gina Reinhart, uh, was building an iron ore mine, um, the, the Roy Hill mine. And it required such a workforce, even though Western Australia, again, produces a big chunk of the world's iron ore and is a mining jurisdiction, it, we couldn't find the skills or enough skills at the time to build this large iron ore mine. So there was a specific, a special visa worked out with the government and this the, the mine was in, in um, partnership with a Korean company. The government worked out a special visa whereby thousands of Korean workers could have come over for the duration of the project and actually work on that mine and then, and then went back home. That was the desperate need that we had at the time. There were a number of mines under construction. I can certainly see a similar challenge being faced by Canada if all of those projects you showed on that earlier slide suddenly need to come into production over the span of a, a few years. And it's the same for engineering companies, right? Imagine the amount of people that they need to deploy just to focus on all of those, like I said, construction activities, and like I said, and then all the trades, you name it. It's I think that will be some of our biggest challenge, you know, to face uh, from that perspective. But uh, no, Ryan, I mean, I, I we turn it back to you now. So, yeah, I wanted to uh, sort of re revisit what with your work uh, on on the Critical Minerals Council. Uh, you're, I believe, a co-chair with uh, a gentleman from Toyota Canada, correct? Um, and so I was just curious uh, about the discussions that you're having uh, with others along the uh, um, the supply chain, uh, such as the auto sector, uh, who are also fa focused on the energy transition and under pressure to meet the uh, decarbonization deadlines. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it, it to me is one of the um, <clears throat> one of the most useful things I think about our chambers uh, critical mineral council is the fact that it's um, basically across the whole supply chain to your point and so um, I co-chair the council with Scott McKenzie who's director of government affairs for Toyota um, I think I think having people at that table who are and, and and really represent every facet so not just from sort of the production facilities at Highland Valley Copper to the Toyota plant, <laughs> but everything you can think of in between. Do you know, we have people that represent um, the the, uh, the, ba the the battery makers, we have people that represent recyclers, we have people that represent, um, there's academics in that group, um, there's folks like David, there's a couple of different engineering companies, construction companies, and so we really, you can talk about the whole value chain in that room. And I think that's been really useful, especially as the federal government was developing policy. And as we've had to what David was speaking about before, we tend to at each council meeting um, have the ability to interact with government officials as a group. And I think it kind of changes the nature of the discussion. And not only is it uh, useful for us around the table as we're thinking through, you know, how these different policy areas might impact us all differently, how we can better coordinate and work together maybe to overcome um, some of the hiccups that might be in the value supply chain. But I think it also really helps inform government how they look at that whole picture, you know, so they don't just think about uh, the critical minerals aren't just about, you know, as much as I focus on my day to day, obviously, on what the challenges we have at tech and how to uh, make our company better and, and make sure that we're doing what we need to do and getting where we need to get on policy, but that that's being done within a context of what does that whole supply chain look like. Uh, and so that's been very important. I can tell you, um, just co-chairing with Scott and I have had many interesting conversations. You know, he's with an OEM and I'm with a big mining company around just the issue, just as one example, right? Just the issue of standards. So as you probably all are aware, there's a lot of talk these days in mining about the various standards that um, some of us adhere to and that some of us have worked on, you know, for tech, it's TSM. Um, you know, we're very proud to have copper mark and now zinc mark uh, for, for our facilities. Um, and so we, we do those things because it's the right thing to do. We're very proud of our ESG work. Um, we think it's a must do. We think it's actually a business prerogative. However, um, when the point comes up and some people will come to that table and, and say, you know, at some point a company like tech producing that way is going to get a premium for it. It's very interesting that both Scott and I um, are of the same mind that that day is not today, <laughs> you know, but we come at it from very different perspectives. And I happen to know that our marketing team is being offered a premium for those products. And Scott will be the first to say, we can't offer you a premium uh, because the market won't bear it. 
left, you know? And so policymakers sometimes who have heard him and I have this exchange are a little surprised because I think some policymakers think, well, obviously if a company like tech is going to put all this time and effort into meeting these standards, they must be getting paid for it somehow and not really understanding that we do it for other reasons, investor reasons, non-monetary reasons, like ESG reasons just in and of themselves, right? Uh, and so I think policymakers having the chance to hear that discussion uh, and, you know, uh, other discussions like it where it's just that, you know, they have one thing in their mind and they're surprised to hear when two very different kinds of organizations can agree. I think there's some real, real value to that. And it's, yeah, it's collaboration, right? It's to connect us across the supply chain. I think that's the big difference I've seen um, in, industry, in industry, especially in the last 12 to 18 months. No one can do it alone. Um, the one thing I'll say about the nice thing about the council is uh, the site visits. That was something that was unique. I know Tech offered a, a site visit um, to a Highland Valley Copper. I, I was there and there was other uh, members who attended. And the one thing that I think it's important because, it, you know, we talk about critical minerals often, but it's also the themes of sustainability, decarbonization. And there was some things that, you know, tech's been around for a lot longer than, than a lot of other companies in, in, in terms of Canada. The one thing I remember from the visit specifically was the reclamation. That was a key part of the visit. Um, you know, you talked about the fish um, that you guys stocked, the land, um, even from a reclamation, going through all the learnings, um, but also the wild horses. So that was something that's unique, you know, having been in the mining industry for, for a long time you don't see every day. And I just want to comment that that's something that we have to think about for people like Chris and, and Winston who want to develop projects, we can learn from others who are doing the, the right thing and raising the bar. So I just want to comment on that, Marcella, that, you know, that, that was something that was, I'll just say important from leadership, from a tech point of view, uh, because it was important. And, and, and even on the indig indigenous leadership, our tour guide, she was amazing, right? Um, and I just throw it back to you just to kind of close that out because, like I said, you were, you guys were the host, but that that was something that was I'll just say important um, to pass on to others who who want to develop projects. Well, thanks so much for that. I know my colleagues at HVC at Highland Valley would be so thrilled to hear that. Obviously, as you saw yourself, our workforce is extremely proud of the work that we do, um, especially on the ESG efforts. To your point, I mean that site's been operating now for you know decades. And so I think there's been a lot of learnings from the site. And what's exciting to me right now from a mining perspective is as technology has improved and processes have improved, you know, we now know that we can uh, design, build and reclaim the site. You know, we can plan that all at once. It's not just about doing one thing at a time. You've got to be constantly thinking about what does this site look like in 20, 30, 40 years? And that's what I think was so um, evident in our visit, especially that the wild horses always blow people away. <laughs> the fact that they've gone from, you know, three or four to 120, 200 size herd, and now we're trying to figure out how to expand their presence. Um, it's quite joyful. But again, I think back to the critical mineral strategy, this is, you know, the, the, the permitting challenges and uh, the kind of regulatory uh, systems we we live under, you can see them as challenges and sometimes they are, but they're also opportunities, you know, like we always say, um, we want to be regulated, we want to be well regulated, we actually think, again, that that's a business, that's a, that's a good for us in business to be well regulated, but those regulations need to be efficient and they need to work and they need to, they need to basically provide some certainty that as a company that's going to make investments uh, and, and wants to make a a good profit and wants to be able to treat their um, communities and workers well that we need to know there's some certainty there and so I think that, that you know that the two kind of have to go hand in hand is how we would view it you don't get a site that looks like HVC um, and that has all those amazing benefits without having had uh, some pretty good regulatory processes over the years and also the ability for us to work with regulators to make sure that we're working in tandem yeah and yeah, I was going to say, what's you know, throw it back to you, Chris, because you're you're seeing all this, and there's obviously a lot of commonality. It was a, like I said, an Aussie-based company. Um, obviously, like I said it's in you know high regard for the same you know the the same item. So yeah, it was. How do you see Canada and, and you know working in Quebec in the in a similar way? Well, I think what um, Marcella just said is really interesting, and maybe maybe it, that's the ultimate aim of 
the critical minerals strategy is to create an eco a, a critical minerals ecosystem in in Canada that makes it that makes it commercially viable to to maintain these high levels of um, ESG compliance. And so, as you say, you're actually getting a commercial credit for doing it. And I think that's one of the things that the strategy is trying to facilitate. And it's something that certainly in the lithium space, Australia doesn't do particularly well or hasn't done in the past. There hasn't been a great deal of government support. And as a consequence, although we mine almost 50% of the world's lithium, we send virtually all of it to China to be converted into lithium hydroxide, which then goes into the batteries. So there's a huge supply chain issue there. We're reliant on um, another another country to convert it. Um, and that then goes, it often comes back to Australia or goes elsewhere in the world. So with early intervention from government and through initiatives like the, the critical mineral strategy, then I th hopefully that ecosystem can be developed in Canada and and it gives explorers and developers like us an opportunity to aspire uh, towards a certain level. The um, you know, it changes the subject to um, more about industry awareness. Um, it's not all about mining, right? We, we know that and in fact when we engage um, especially policymakers, I'll say the one area they often talk about is tell me about the manufacturing or the processing and manufacturing side. And we know that in Canada, that's something that we want to develop more. And, and there are a lot of announcements as we saw in Quebec and Ontario, and, and especially Bay Concord, we're going to see more processing, for example, the mask of lithium, I think just broke ground. Um, they're right beside, I think a block away from the the GM, um, uh, the GM site in Bay Concours. So it is changing. And I wanted to ask both of you, you know, how do you see the need for processing? And maybe I'll start with Chris, because do we need, you know, if every company has a lithium conversion plant as part of their, you know, feasibility study, do we need that many lithium conversion plants? You know, can, can you maybe just comment on the processing side, whether it's, what do we need for Canada or what do we need for North America from, from that point of view? It's an, it's an extremely important point, and I think it's a gaps, again, referring specifically to the lithium industry, that conversion capability is a real gap, and Australia, as I just referred to, has got that gap, uh, and it's certainly not easy to fill the gap. There's currently three conversion facilities, either one's just been completed and two are under construction in Western Australia. The first one that's been completed is not operating at capacity and in fact it was built in Western Australia by Tianqi, one of the largest Chinese lithium producers. They have several converters in China and they've had no end of trouble building that con a converter and getting it operational in Western Australia. Because they're technically very difficult, they require a lot of expertise that isn't in Australia despite the lithium mining expertise and I think Canada is going to have uh, the exact same issues. As you say, uh, Namaska um, Live Vent has broken ground on their conversion facility in Beckencore, and I was lucky enough to have a tour of Beckencore a couple of weeks ago. As you say, it's uh, amazing seeing them breaking ground here, and then there's a huge facility for GM being built uh, right next door. Yeah. Then there's the port and there's rail, all the infrastructure's there. Um, but that expertise is going to be very difficult to get. And you're right, not every mine not every mine can expect to have its own conversion facility. So I think that comes back to collaborations in the industry to make sure that we use the technical resources that are available um, to maximise everyone's opportunity to keep as much of that value chain in Canada as possible rather than send it elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, the positive, it's happening. I mean, I, I did the same. I, I took my team at SGS. We did a field trip. We went to Bay Concours. We went to Schwinnigan. They're developing a battery hub. And it was really to engage and, and actually just see what's happening. And yeah, there's, I mean, it's real. It's happening. Um, you know, Mar Marcella, now, like I said, uh, you know, you, you're often involved in these, like I said, the more direct policy discussions. What, what can you sort of tell us on the, the processing and manufacturing side of the, the discussion? So I think it's, I, I'm going to be perhaps a bit uh, controversial here and say, I think it's it's a very challenging. I think it's something that people are talking about a lot now uh, and that 
I'm not sure there's any simple answers. And so um, what is interesting to us in this moment uh, and to me specifically on a policy level is what we've seen the Canadian government do in terms of these battery manufacturing hubs, et cetera, uh, is really industrial policy at a scale we probably haven't seen maybe since the Second World War, right? So you're seeing the federal and provincial governments invest billions of dollars, um, you know, not just capital investment, but adding operating investment and production fees to make sure that they can uh, try and draw those, those investments to Canada. You know, we think that's probably what the situation requires if we want part of this infrastructure in Canada, but I guess you know, I would say a couple things in a policy level. I never want people to forget that what we're talking about is a North American supply chain. Um, it's so important because, first of all, that's really how our trade works. <laughs> you know, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that we keep talking about Canadian production, Canadian. Yes, I totally agree. And I want to see more manufacturing here, but you can't just suddenly turn over over you know a couple hundred years of trade and and not understand there's still going to be a significant north south flow. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's important to recognize. And then the second thing I would say is you know these industries are are nascent and so there's you know going to be some complicated uh, financial investments that need to be made by governments. I'm glad to see them doing it frankly, but we're in a very we're in a very critical moment to be, you'll exclude, excuse the slight pun <laughs> with critical minerals in the sense that if we don't make some of these big swing investments right now, uh, then we're not going to be prepared for what happens in the next 10 years as uh, this electrification really takes hold and the move to net zero. And so that's why actually tech, you know, I guess you as a company you look at that and you say, well, what's the role that we can play? Well, that's why we're looking at this EV battery recycling project at Trail, right? Because there's where we have our processing expertise. We can produce, we've done, you know, scaling. We, we, we can produce up to enough materials for about 140,000 electric vehicle batteries uh, a year once that thing was operational and it would be the biggest such facility in, in Western North America. So again, I think it's partly just as a company, company by company almost, if you can look at those opportunities that are there as nascent as that industry is right now, and you want to get focused on the manufacturing, refining, et cetera, you know, value added, if you will, David, in terms of what you're trying to produce, then I think you've got to start with what your expertise is. And so I get a little nervous when governments keep sort of dropping this policy idea, like I'm hearing it more and more, we have to do more about manufacturing. I would prefer to talk in the concrete. Where do we think our strengths are as a country? recognizing that what we're trying to do here is strengthen North American supply chain um, and recognizing that, um, you know, we don't, we maybe don't have a hugely broad expertise in these areas, but we have some specific expertise that we can, I think, bring to the table. Yeah, I mean, myself worked, you know, working for uh, Glencore Extrada, Falcon Bridge, Naranda, you know, we, we've exited some of those smelting refining businesses and so we have to bring the processing back to North America. The, I'll say the advantage is Canada is the first mover in this supply chain. That's a huge benefit and we, you know, we can all rally, but I think that's gonna be, you know, is that a potential bottleneck for us? We know, you know, the, the having the mine opportunities, there, there's tons of opportunity. Um, how do we accelerate and yeah, how do we come back to a processing base? From, from that point of view, going back to the you know early slide with all the bubbles, the project bubbles, right? Um, you know that that's that's what we all want to achieve. Um, so maybe Ryan, I I know we're getting you know we're now we're getting close to the you know Q and A time. So is this a is this a good time to to maybe look at uh, turn that over now to the audience and give them a chance to uh, to engage here? You know so our experts here, uh, our, our expert panelists, and they've been very active. So, okay, good, you, great. Thank you out there for your. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm not sure we can take all of these on. <laughs> um, but uh, so one of the things you, you you talked about sort of cross border collaboration. Um, and 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 one person asks with respect to cooperation, this new critical mineral strategy puts a lot of restriction and uh, protection on research and innovation so it, ha it has made it hard for researchers and scientists to work openly uh, with others in in other parts of the world uh, conversely scientists researchers working um, 
uh, in other parts of the world have now been restricted um, within those countries from, and it just, it makes the whole uh, um, research uh, cooperation and collaboration more difficult. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if, uh, if, if you have any, have any, have any thoughts on, on, I guess the, the geopolitical impacts on, on um, this research and collaboration. Who wants to jump in? Chris, you were talking about Australia, China, right? I mean, you know, is there somewhere to start from, from that perspective? I think there's, I think Australia has had um, some similar interactions with China as, as Canada has over the last few years. Uh, differences in approaches and policies have led to some friction in the relationship. Uh, but I think Australia has found that and and perhaps it's the same with Canada, although um, maybe we don't see that yet, is that although there's a North American supply chain, these policies are aimed at developing a, a North American supply chain for critical minerals that can't be completely insular. And we need uh, other countries' uh, skills and expertise, as Marcello was talking about before, I think we need to bring those in and, and use them in order to develop the supply chain in Canada and North America in general. So I, I don't think there can be a total exclusion and um, ho hopefully these policies don't lead to that. I mean, I know I can comment that what I've seen change is, you know, for example, look at the IRA. It's been extremely successful. Even when there's European battery conferences, they're still talking about the you know, Inflation Reduction Act and how successful it is, and they wish they had something similar. Um, and, and the benefit, when we think about an innovation point of view, is Canada is a domestic supplier under the IRA and, and also under the um, uh, the Defence Production Act as well. And so I think that's what's changing the map. Some of these conferences now, I, I know there are discussions between, let's say, Canada and the EU from um, to try to find a way to work together so that we're not we're not competing, right? Like, yes, there's a North American, I'll say centric thing happening, but the EU doesn't, we don't wanna compete in the long term, especially with some really smart technical people in some of these niche markets. Um, so, so I think things will change more from a collaboration, especially on, I'll say on the R&D side, because um, we're gonna need, you know, to do things differently than we've done it in the past. I mean, I'm not a scientist or a researcher, I'm just a policy nerd, so um, I can't really speak to anything going on in that space. I think what I would say, maybe I'm a glass half full kind of person anyway, what I would say though is that this moment of, in some places and ways, obviously terrible geopolitical conflict, but I would say on the critical minerals policy front, you have seen some pretty extraordinary collaboration um, not just with the EU, I totally agree with David, the EU, those conversations are very interesting. I would say um, the conversations we've had obviously with the US and we, we produce in Alaska, so we, you know, very alive to those conversations and again, very interesting, but also our customers, um, particularly thinking we have very strong customer bases in Japan and Korea. I think the whole uh, Asia Pacific conversation for Canada is very interesting right now. Um, challenging a little bit with India perhaps, but I still think that us recognizing the leadership role we can play, particularly on critical metals and, and materials, I would include steel making coal in that conversation um, with our customers in Korea and Japan, who by the way have the very same net zero uh, GHG reduction goals that Canada does. So they're not just an ally in terms of being longstanding customers and people who sell us goods, but also in terms of our goals, you know, our policy goals for reaching net zero. Um, I think those kinds of collaborations uh, have been very interesting and, and perhaps even accelerated through this period. So, um, yeah, I have no doubt there are other challenges that maybe I'm not seeing, but the window I'm looking through, um, there's a lot of interesting collaboration going on. All right. Um, thank you. So. Uh, this one I think uh, directed more at, at, at Chris. Um, <laughs> the person asked, don't we have to first discover and outline new lithium deposits before worrying uh, about how we're going to uh, develop them? So I'm just, from your perspective, um, like do we have the, um, 
the baseline uh, data um, to be to be finding lithium deposits in, in in this country, or what is the this? What's your perspective on that? There's various lithium mines at various stages of development at the moment in Canada. So we saw the Sayona mine come into production earlier this year, and it's now it's now producing a spodumene concentrate. Although at this point it can't be converted in 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 Canada. Uh, the Namaska mine has got a defined resource. Uh, Alchem's James Bay uh, has a defined resource with a, each of those have got a 20 plus year mine life. Um, Critical Elements has a defined resource, again, with a, with a study and many of its permits in place. Um, there are four or five mines that are cap have defined resources and are capable of coming into production in the next three or so years. We are we're spending sort of three and a half million dollars a month drilling at the moment to define our maiden resource and also doing our study work uh, with the aim of coming to production in about five years. And there's another uh, similar company, Patriot, who's just defined their maiden resource. Uh, they're presumably working on a similar time frame. So I think there's been there's enough evidence that there are at least half a dozen mines capable of coming into production on the lithium space over the next, uh, b before the end of this decade anyway. And so that's certainly enough to indicate that there's a, and that if they all come into production, that will be a good chunk of the world's supply going forward. So the, the lithium industry is is there in Quebec and it's, it's going to be part of that critical minerals uh, internal supply chain. So we, we've defined it, but there's a lot more to come. There's still a lot of exploration going on. There's a whole lot of geological data that's historical data that's been based on other uh, exploration for other minerals, but is applicable to lithium, which many junior companies are now looking through. And I'm sure there'll be other other resources in the lithium space to find uh, in the coming years. In, yeah, in and, and other provinces as well. I mean, I know, like I said, we we spend a lot of, course, of time yeah. talking about Quebec, but Ontario, you know, Frontier. A rock tech, um, you know, a, a more out west, like a, three, a geolithium brine, you know. So there's there's lots of diversity there, um, and I think often we we call sometimes in conferences now they say the North American lithium triangle. I've heard people test at now conferences just because of that. Yeah, Brian, get it. Squeeze another. So we can squeeze another few questions here. Yeah, I think we could probably fit. Uh, one more in. I don't know if you'd any, seen any on the list here that 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 you'd uh, uh, suggest. But um, let's see. Uh, so this this is more about, I guess, evolving uh, business models of a kind and the circular economy as such. Um, at a policy level, do Canadians or and or Australians realize, realize that if local supply chains sell these critical minerals once, then they can't sell them again. Um, are we looking to find or implement uh, our circular uh, model for uh, retaining um, these minerals and um, being able to um, you know, keep repurposing or re re recycling them? Um, in a more circular approach. We could have a whole webinar on just <laughs> that part of the supply <laughs> chain, to be honest. It's a, it's, that, that's a whole, I'll say, a deeper topic. Um, but new supply chains, I'll just say one comment. In the long term, you know, some analysts have said, hey, it's not just mines, land, I'll say terrestrial mines um, that are going to be the future supply. We're going to need significant recycling and, and new supply chains, right? There's things like the polymetallic C nodules, and not everyone's keen on the ocean. It's a, that's up for debate, right, about sustainability and all that. But the point is, um, there are other potential resources, and we need to think of all of them in the longer term, right. from from that perspective. Yeah, I would just, you know, there's a big discussion. Um, at, there's a big discussion on at London hmm. Metals Exchange Week, LME Week, this year about um, you know, the need for more 
copper recycling uh, and someone made the point that yes we of course need to do a better job on copper recycling of course tech's a major copper producer but we're not going to recycle our way out of our tech shortage that's coming out of our copper shortage and so we need both and is what uh, I, I think I think this is a both and situation where you need to figure out how to do responsible sustainable production and increase that at the same time while you're um, putting efforts into R&D to look at all kinds of recycling opportunities, including, frankly, you know, I think tech and others are very interested in tailings, uh, recycling possibilities that might be coming our way. There's there's technology being developed to look at how do you turn a uh, how do you turn a former tailings pond into something that's now producing uh, economically. That may be that may come to pass. So I think. I think we've got to be interested in investing in all kinds of opportunities. And again, that's another reason why we're looking at this EV battery recycling opportunity. We we know we've got the expertise to get to take those that black mass and make lithium cobalt and, and nickel that's battery grade and you can keep that material, you know, recycling through North America, but it doesn't mean you won't need new sources for that material, in our view. And it's also right. high value commodities or materials, um, you know, especially materials because, for example, rare earths, you know, we need, there are companies setting up for recycling process for rare earths. It's not just lithium ion battery recycling. And I think that will open up lots of opportunity, especially from an innovation point of view. I know we're getting short in time, Ryan, so maybe throw it back to you. Yeah, I think we just need to tie this off. Um, so, uh, Chris, are there any uh, final thoughts that you wanted to uh, leave us with before we go? I think it's just very encouraging for us as a, a explorer slash about to be developer that the critical mineral strategy, the billions of dollars that have been allocated from the government and the other incentives we see them applying to bring uh, gigafactories and uh, further upstream users, uh, downstream users, I should say, of lithium uh, to uh, creating that need for lithium in Canada is encouraging. And then a base level for us, the tax incentives, the infrastructure and the general support we see from the government for establishing a mine is also um, encouraging at that base level. So for us, it's it's um, uh, al almost at, at both ends, there's, there's encouragement and support from the government for us to explore for and develop a lithium mine. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you both. Hold on, Ryan, Marcella, oh, we just want to give Marcella a chance uh, also. Final comment. <laughs> I feel like I have my final comment. Um, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, guys. Really nice to chat. And Chris, nice to meet you. We'll see you around. <laughs> nice to meet, meet you, Marcella, and thank you both. All right. Uh, thank Ryan, you. Ryan, as I see we have uh, two minutes left, I'll just make a quick one. Um, often when people say, what's your wish for industry, I, I will say, I wish for boards and investors we treated that early um that that initial investment when you need to develop the project like insurance meaning you need to put the right resources in to help de-risk a project and it's not easy because there's competition um but but i hope going forward that that like I said both both boards the way they communicate um you know, management teams, like I said, and investors understand that some of these commodities need a different type of investment um, on the front end. These are not your typical gold and copper projects that people are used to. They are more iterative um, and, and, and especially some of the de-risking that needs to be done on the front end to, to make them successful, right? And sometimes we need to be patient, even in a world where we're running crazy, you know, too fast from from that perspective but that's that that's something if we can somehow change that um and, and it's tough right because these are all capital markets and everyone's competing great well thank you marcella thank you chris thank you david i'm sorry we've we've run out of time uh it was a great conversation um this uh recording uh will be available to all the attendees and we'll be emailed you tomorrow um and after this there'll be a quick a survey that pops up and we do ask that uh, you could fill that out and it'll help us uh, refine this uh, as we go forward. Um, so thank you everyone. Thanks for joining. We hope to see you at our next mission critical webinar date to be determined. Um, you can always uh, follow us on social or visit the uh, CIM calendar of events at cim.org.
Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank Thanks, everyone. Evening. Bye.